Today's webinar is based on a report led by Friends of the Global Fight that came out last month, uh, looking at the Global Fund's work to strengthen health systems and um, play a key role in advancing towards universal health coverage. I'm going to make some key points related to the report and just walk you through that very briefly. Uh, and then we're gonna hear from each of our speakers for about five minutes each. And then hopefully we'll have 15 minutes at the end of this session uh, for Q and A from the audience. And feel free at any time to put your questions or comments into the Q and A box and we'll be reading from those at the end of the session. Thanks very much. So uh, can we have the slides? All right. Um, so this is the report that came out last month, and you can see there is a link to that there. We encourage you to go and take a look at the report yourself. Next slide, please. So the Global Fund is and always has been focused on ending the epidemics of AIDS, TB, and malaria, and the Global Fund partnership has made great progress against all three of these diseases. In fact, it's that progress and that work battling AIDS, TB, and malaria that is itself a really important contribution to advancing universal health coverage. But through its more focused work on AIDS, TB, and malaria, the Global Fund has also made important impacts on health systems. Often it's not acknowledged as a critical player in UHC. For example, in the political declaration of the high-level meeting on UHC this summer, uh, this September, the Global Fund was only mentioned in passing. But what we want to talk about today is how the Global Fund actually plays a really critical role in the future of UHC. So we wanted to take a closer look at its work on core aspects of health systems. Next slide. And you can see this visual from the report looks at the 10 areas of the health system that we looked at and um, the Global Fund's contribution in each of them. And this lines up with the WHO building blocks of health systems. So the report looks at um, laboratory capacity, engaging community actors, strengthening the healthcare workforce, health information systems, uh, ensuring a, a supply of uh, medical products, medical oxygen, catalyzing uh, domestic public sector investments, strengthening governance, placing human rights, gender, and equity at the center of health and engaging the private sector. All those areas are related to WHO building blocks of a health system. And they're all, we all look at the Global Fund's contribution in each of those areas with uh, many country specific examples in each one of those. Next slide, please. The report also found that the Global Fund has real relevance to health systems and UHC, but it's not just about strengthening former, formal um, aspects of health systems, but also about the value set that the Global Fund brings to its work and that we argue is critical across health uh, more broadly, including in health systems and universal health coverage and in pandemic preparedness. And you can see some of those areas we identified that are uh, really in the value set of the Global Fund that we think are critical um, across all health, evidence-based programming, community systems, human rights-based approaches, oversight, a focus on results, multi-stakeholder engagement, incentives for domestic resources, and reaching key and marginalized populations. Next slide. It's also important to say that in addition, um, the Global Fund has real impact on global public goods in health in multiple areas. This infographic identifies three of those areas, pooled pro procurement mechanisms, health management information, logistic uh, management for um, uh, supply chains. Next slide. Another area where the Global Fund has broad impact is its growing support for community health workers. And this is discussed in the report. This investment is an example of how investing in people and in capacity to respond to health needs today enables communities to provide health services and be better prepared to identify and respond to new disease threats. Next slide. And this is really the takeaway message from the report. Investment through the Global Fund is certainly not the only pathway to universal coverage at all. 
but this analysis suggests that it will be an indispensable partner, uh, partner in achievement of this goal. Given its dramatic success in fighting AIDS, TB, and malaria, its track record of investing in cross-cutting systems, and its unique model emphasizing results, equity, and engagement, the Global Fund should play a central role in global efforts to achieve access to quality health services for all. Next slide. And here's our lineup for today's uh, session. We're first going to hear from Shinsuke Mabuchi. Uh, he is the Director of Resilient and Sustainable Systems for Health and Pandemic Preparedness and Response at the Global Fund. Then we'll get five perspectives from implementers, from a donor, from the private sector, and from a community leader. And um, then we'll have an expert wrap up from what we've heard. I again would ask the speakers, each of you, please stick to five minutes each, and I will let you know if you go over. With no further ado, let's take those slides down, and then Shun, please go ahead. Thank you, Chris. And first of all, huge thank you for uh, friends of the Global Fight for developing a great report and also organizing this webinar. It's a great honor uh, to open the session with uh, a great panel, uh, members for country, uh, partners, and private sector and civil society. As they can provide strong country and community perspectives, I will share some high-level strategic overview and direction of the Global Fund work for uh, health system and universal health coverage. Uh, as the Friends report said, there are two really important ways that the Global Fund significantly and uniquely uh, can contribute to universal health coverage. First is through the effective control of HIV, TB, and malaria. Uh, a critical aspect of UHC is providing health services to prevent and treat the deadliest infectious diseases. Since its establishment in 2002, the Global Fund partnership has saved 59 million lives and reduce the combined death rate of the three diseases by more than half. This is a tremendous contribution. And we will continue focusing on ending HIV, TB, and malaria as public health threats. The second way it contributes to our UHC is through its health and community system strengthening as uh, Chris introduced. The Global Fund is the largest uh, multilateral provider of grants uh, for health system strengthening. Uh, it has invested $1.5 billion a year uh, in health and community systems in the past three years. And now with the shift of our COVID-19 response funding, we will be able to provide about $2 billion a year in health system and pandemic preparedness and response uh, in the next three years. This is an unprecedented scale up of our health systems and PPR investments in global fund history. So given the size and well-established country-owned platforms and expertise and partnership we have been building, uh, I would say the international as an international funding mechanism, it's the World Bank and the Global Fund that are really main financiers for the health systems and universal health coverage. And more importantly, the Global Fund's health systems and PPR work has unique capabilities that we are really working to maximize to better contribute to UHC. I will highlight three main things. First is our ability to work with the government, private sector, and communities. Like the World Bank, we fund the government directly for them to implement country programs. In addition, we have really strong partnership with community-based and community-led organizations that can provide people-centered services to marginalized populations. This is a critical feature of the Global Fund as a core part of the UHC is equity and inclusion. Second is our unique ability to leverage and integrate disease investment to build systems. This is our critical direction as our disease investments are huge. And if we can more intentionally integrate them to strengthen the country's public health functions, it will increase efficiency and sustainability of HIV, TB, and malaria investments and also significantly contribute to UHC. It's easy to say, difficult to do, but that's a really important direction going forward for the Global Fund. Third, an important area that the report highlights is its ability to support key functions of the health systems that contribute to HIV, TB, and malaria and UHC outcomes. That includes health workers, including community health workers, 
uh, laboratory, supply chain, data system, community systems. And also with C19 RM resources, we stepped up to support early warning surveillance and response system and oxygen and respiratory care system as a core part of the pandemic preparedness and response uh, work. What is important and uh, what we need to really further improve our ability to support is the uh, support critical functions strategically long-term in 10-year horizon through multi-cycle funding. Strengthening health systems and public health functions takes time. So maximizing our ability uh, for strategic long-term funding is really, really important. So I must say that these are all work in progress and the direction that we are taking uh, with much more improvement uh, we need to make happen. The next two years uh, will be extremely important for the Global Fund and the partnership to demonstrate results and its contributions to universal health coverage. So many challenges ahead, but I'm really excited about it. Thank you, Chris. Back to you. Thank you so much, Shun. That was a that was a great introduction, um, and thank you for staying within five minutes. So great. Uh, next, we want to hear five perspectives um, uh, from some great speakers. The first is Dr. Sabine Avzal. She is a Deputy Director of Programs Health System at the Ministry of National Health Services Regulation and Coordination in Pakistan. Dr. Avzal, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Thank you, and uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone, depending on what time zone you are in. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, um, thank you for giving this opportunity to, Pakistan, to share Pakistan experience. Um, early in 2000, when Global Fund was created, uh, there was more focus on vertical disease focus, but uh, hence uh, Global Fund uh, funded uh, uh, the three diseases and helped uh, and facilitated Pakistan in prevention, diagnosis, management, and treatment of these diseases. Uh, despite having a disease focus, uh, the health system um, uh, approach has always been embedded in grant making and in um, uh, implementing uh, these disease focus uh, uh, activities uh, in the country. Um, uh, uh, if I talk about uh, linking with the UHC, UHC, the, we always talk about PHC and UHC. So Global Fund supported at all level of healthcare facilities, including the primary health care. And if we look at uh, the uh, some of the activities that uh, Global Fund had been supporting in Pakistan for primary health care, including the uh, trainings of the primary health uh, care staff uh, uh, and uh, uh, providing medicine and equipment for screening and uh, uh, referral of the patients uh, and their management and treatment. Uh, Pakistan has a very large cadre of community health worker, the lady health worker, and Global Fund has been engaging uh, in Pakistan with the lady health worker for identifying the present uh, cases of TB and, uh, and uh, referring them to the healthcare facility for uh, treatment. And these uh, lady health worker has also been trained for supporting uh, TB dots uh, in Pakistan. Um, Another area um, that I would like to talk about is the data and digital information system. I think the Global Fund uh, paved the pathway of DHIS2 in Pakistan, and it was the first um, uh, um, uh, support that came to uh, for uh, uh, shifting from DHIS to DHIS2 for the three diseases. But now it has taken, um, you know, or uh, the routine health system has also been shifted to DHIS2. Um, while uh, uh, we uh, it um, and we uh, also uh, in Pakistan uh, back in 2016 and 17 there was a separate health system grant was also offered which Pakistan um, uh, secured and it helped us in uh, uh, assessing and bringing efficiency, not only in the disease program, but overall using the pool procurement mechanism, uh, the financial mechanism, monitoring mechanism, and supply improving the supply chain mechanism. One of the uh, things that later helped us in COVID was a combined, uh, very state of art uh, 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 warehouse, uh, which helped us in that. 
um, I think in the recent uh, uh, the global fund has uh, taken from is uh, while keeping its disease focus for being part of the integrated uh, uh, national health support program as a part of the multi donor trust fund which focus on redefining and reforming the primary health care in Pakistan. However, we have there are few challenges which need more strengthening. There are areas which need to work more, uh, like uh, using the government fusility mechanism and strengthening of the CCM and uh, 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 the oversight mechanism in, in the country. Uh, together, I think we can work uh, very well uh, towards uh, improving the uh, uh, moving towards universal health care services and um, uh, together we can all work to uh, strengthen primary health care for to achieve uhc i'll stop here thank you very much wonderful thank you um so much dr ozal for for that presentation um Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Mustafa Batie. He is Director of Health Services at the Ministry of Health in the Gambia. Welcome, doctor. Oh, thank you very much, Chris, for organizing this, and we really appreciate it. Um, I don't need to talk about the gains that we have achieved in the three diseases because it is immense. Um, for example, in the Gambia, it used to be endemic for malaria. So everybody expects to have malaria, almost everyone, once, at least once in every year. But now we are on the verge of elimination of malaria. But the report is important like you should, because not only trying to eliminate the three diseases or to achieve a significant reduction, but in the process, we are empowering our for health system. And not only for the three diseases, but for all the other diseases. And this can be shown in many ways. For example, in the Gambia, before, you know, especially COVID, we did not have any medical grade oxygen generated in the country. So all the medical grade we used to import. And we had a factory that, that, that was producing um, industrial grade oxygen. You know, and that's what we mainly depended on our oxygen concentrators. But when the COVID came in, so there was moratorium from all countries, so you cannot get, you know, oxygen even if you had the resources or the money to buy. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, so what happened is now global fund with other partners like the World Bank and the UN have really stepped in and supported us to have now oxygen plants in the country. And this has really gone a long way because. Previously, our physicians had to rush on the oxygen. So oxygen in the country was only not given to only who needed it, but it was given to the people who needed it the most because you had to rush on it. Uh, but now with this uh, support that was meant to help in the COVID, it, COVID is long gone now, but you know we are all benefiting from this and it's going to be sustained. And the remarkable way it was done was built in sustainability because what has happened is that we had a contract where for the next four years, we had a contract with the supplier to maintain the machines or the plants. And whilst we train our individual people, part of the contract for each machine is to train four to eight people who will be able to maintain. And right now within these four years, there will be transfer of skills, learning on the administration and others. So it really is a superb project that the Gambia is very proud of. And we thank the Global Forum and all the partners who contributed to make this happen. The other important um, uh, project that we are really grateful that is handled through the SSF system is the, our laboratory spokes network system. The Gambia is very flat and long. So what happens is that for patients to do tests, even for the three diseases, it used to be difficult because they have to travel across regions sometimes to meet uh, the possibilities that can do specific tests. So it was not sustainable to have laboratory tests in every uh, facility because some of them are sparsely populated and it will not be cost effective. So we developed now a sample referral, a sample referral network, which is like a spokes like system where the samples are collected from you know hinterland regularly brought to one area where it is regularly collected. 
and the Global Fund is supporting this. This has really, really helped in out of pocket spending for people with delay in time, you know, and the way the samples are. Here. This is really marvelous. And uh, this is something that other countries can benefit from, from the Global Fund. Because now we are not using it for tra transporting samples of uh, only the three diseases, but it's a system that is developed to help the whole population. Um, another good one we have is the last mile support we got from Global Fund. You know, we used to have the pool system. Uh, once we get all these um, logistics and all the supplies to the regional stores, so it depended on the facilities. So that last mile to get them, um, uh, the supplies is usually very difficult. Still not yet 100% sorted out, but we are so happy with the support we got from Global Fund to help strengthen this. So we are going, it's been improved, although it's not yet 100%. Recently, we got trucks and others to help us support in this. And associated with this is the ELMIS system, which is electronic. Um, it's helping us to be able to, uh, from our offices at the central level, to be able to monitor, you know, how the stock is moving, where it's going, and so that we can have uh, transparency and supervision, and also ensure that uh, stockouts are, pre are prevented. So we really, really think that uh, this type of investments, you know, in helping the health sector to strengthen all over is, is really important and sometimes it's not uh, well recognized by, uh, by partners everywhere. So the other area we really have support is through the, um, our community health worker system. So Global Fund is helping us to train them. Um, we have about 2000 villages in the country and you know divide it into circuits so each circuit ranges between five to ten blades so we are trying to ensure that we have a very good network of ensuring that um, people in the village are, are trained and you know can give certain services and the resources provided and who is helping in this and one problem we have in that area is the remuneration uh, we, had, we think that the Global Fund will really support in this. Uh, but the government wants to take it up, you know, but the processes are going on and we are happy that the Global Fund is at least helping with the first steps. So once we take it up and make it, um, re, you know, they are reimbursed, they are paid salary, then we can hold them accountable. Uh, but right now it's on voluntary basis and on sites. WHO, well, Global Fund is helping to strengthen that. They are training them, they're giving them the tools they require. And this is really going to help not only the three diseases, but all the diseases that wonderful uh, thank you. that come in. So we have a lot. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Bittier. Those are fantastic examples. If you don't mind, I'm going to move on to our next speakers, and then we can come back at Q&A. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, we wanted to get a perspective from a donor. Um, and we're very pleased to have uh, Ms. Sarah Boulton with us. She is Global Health Fund's team leader uh, at the Global Fund's Department Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in the United Kingdom. Uh, Ms. Boulton, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today because it's such an important subject. Uh, because as, as we look back on the learnings from COVID-19 and forward to the challenges of climate change, it's clear that strong and resilient national and community health systems are critical for protecting and promoting better health outcomes. And thank you also to the Friends of the Global Fight for conducting your review of the Global Fund's contribution to UHC and stronger health systems. It's a great paper. Um, and a really helpful addition to the evidence and thinking around the Global Fund's role on this agenda. So as you note in your paper, the Global Fund is one of the biggest multilateral health actors and a major investor in health systems. So it's critical that we collectively make the best use of that resource. Many of you will be aware that the UK recently published a white paper on international development. The paper sets out a transformative new vision for how UK development assistance should work. At its core, our new approach is about partnership, shaping narratives which developing countries own and deliver. 
So we've spent the last year listening to partner countries tell us how they want the global health architecture to evolve. And they've told us they want global health initiatives to accelerate their contribution to building resilient health systems, to align behind national plans, and to embed sustainability at the heart of their operations. Their call for action has been set out today in the Lusaka agenda, which sets out a renewed vision for global health to deliver sustainable impact within the changing international context. In support of this agenda, we want to accelerate five key shifts in how the Global Fund and other global health initiatives work to support countries to strengthen health systems. First, we need all health partners to more effectively support integrated delivery of services aligned behind one national plan. No. Second, we need to strengthen alignment of all partners behind the objective of financial and programmatic sustainability, supporting movement towards increased domestic spending on health. Third, health partners need to adopt joint approaches to support, expand and complement the reach of public and private sector providers, including community-led organisations, coordinating programme to reach the most vulnerable and marginalised. Fourth, the core governance and operating models of the global health initiatives need to evolve to ensure structures and processes impose a minimal burden on countries, offer improved efficiency at scale, and are continually responsive to the needs and voices of countries, communities, and civil society. And fifth, health partners should coordinate and play an active role to ensure that fit for purpose quality health products are developed and manufactured for underserved regions. So what does the Lusaka agenda mean for the Global Fund? I think the first thing to say is that these shifts are already very largely included in the Global Fund strategy. But the strategy puts much more emphasis on integrated people-centered services, greater emphasis on achieving programmatic and financial sustainability, seeks to develop a more systematic approach to supporting the development and integration of community systems for health, and places greater focus on accelerating the equitable deployment of and access to innovations. What's different about the Lusaka agenda is the priority that countries are placing on not only accelerating these shifts, but also doing them together with other partners and aligning efforts behind country and community-led strategies. The Global Fund is, as you know, already an expansive partnership organisation, which includes the World Bank and the WHO. What countries are asking is that the partnership expands to include all health partners, including Gavi and the Global Financing Facility. And they want that expansion to be not only at the strategic level, but also at the operational level. They want genuinely joined up programming to support and strengthen health systems in line with national and community priorities. And that's a big challenge. It's a challenge to the Global Fund and it's a challenge to all of us as funders, implementers and advocates. So we look forward to working with all of you to take this forward and to get it right because we believe that this is how the Global Fund and others can make the best contribution to universal health coverage and stronger health systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bolton, for that comment. Really appreciate that and, and for bringing in the latest dialogues on the global stage about what's going on. Uh, I do want to remind everybody in the audience, uh, there will be Q&A at the end, and please put any questions you have in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Next, we're going to hear from um, Max Sunik, who is Chief of Staff at Zenesis, and he's going to give us a private sector perspective on the Global Fund and UHC. Max? Thanks, Chris, and kudos for an excellent report. So, hey, folks, my name is Max. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm the Chief of Staff at Zenesis. Uh, we're a strategic partner of the Global Fund since 2018 and also a mission-driven technology company. Um, I want to focus today on just one kind of overarching idea, trust. Um, drawing on some learnings from our eight-year journey supporting public sector partners in 15 countries uh, to improve data-driven decision-making for HIV, TB, malaria, but also health system strengthening overall. Um, we, of course, focus on one of the UHC building blocks, health information systems, um, through technology that harmonizes fragmented data systems for advanced data use. Um, I want to dive right into what we see as one of as the key to effective engagement of the private sector, particularly for UHC. Um, which in our view, the Global Fund is already leading and poised to take further. Um, I'll also offer some critiques of, of the private sector. I know everyone loves that. Um, first, uh, let's be super crystal clear. Um, people must always win in any engagement between the private and public sector. 
um, profit objectives must align with the objectives to maximize the health of communities. Um, we reject the scarcity mindset that drives resources away from the three diseases and also UHC, um, but we also have to recognize the constrained operating environments of our partners. Um, the truth is poor coordination among private sector companies further consumes the limited resources and time of our public sector partners on the front lines. Um, that's why alignment locally determined UHC goals is so, so paramount. Um, competition is important, yes, but let's compete not only on the quality of our offerings, but also to be the best possible health partner. For us at Zenesis, this means co-creating next generation technology and services that equip our partners to rapidly close the most intractable UHC gaps and leave no one behind. The Global Fund gets this, frankly, and they support this type of effective collaboration with catalytic funding. For example, in South Africa, our partnership for advanced data collaboration boosted ART linkage from 60 to 90% for sex workers, a mis and marginalized community often cited um, in UHC as a, blow, as a roadblock to UHC within just one year. Um, in Rwanda, support has enabled a partnership with the government there to bring advanced, an, advanced data analytics down to the community health level for the first time, reinforcing not only TB follow-up, but also overall data use, meeting mixed um, goals. Now we need to recognize another reality. It's costly for innovators to adhere to high ethical standards, um, but also crucial for success meeting UHC. This is where the Global Fund also plays a crucial role in shaping markets and coordinating ethical private sector actors. Few other entities have the value set, as you said, Chris, or size to do so effectively. Um, I often hear the private sector referred to as an engine of innovation. Yes, that's true. But this is also true for the public sector, particularly when decision makers are properly enabled by private sector innovation, whose incentives, governing structures, and tools are designed to further rights-based approaches to health service provision. This requires alignment and coordination across sectors. Um, the Global Fund operates something called the Tech Collective, to which Zenesis belongs, an aligned grouping of tech, act tech actors from specialized companies like Zenesis, all the way up to Microsoft, where we work together to reinforce nationally determined strategies, supported by an absolutely fantastic private sector engagement team. For us, prioritizing alignment means we work with a country's existing investments in their data infrastructure, connecting to things like DHIS2, rather than imposing a competing system. And I think it's time we take a firm stance across. We should decenter private sector actors who do not reinforce locally determined and publicly coordinated UHC agendas and reward those who do. The reality is global health and, and healthcare writ large is rife with private sector actors content with the status quo. For many, profits have surged over the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have to ask where have the corollary outcomes for health systems and people been? This year, we learned the UHC service coverage index has increased only three points since 2015. So I say no more to the status quo of mixed sector collaboration. And I know that the Global Fund is leading the way on this as well. Um, this new vision of collaboration, which is why we pledged $5 million at the seventh Global Fund replenishment alongside a number of the other companies involved in the tech collective and in other groupings that the Global Fund supports. So just to conclude, I think we should fortify the types of collaborations that elevate country leadership and steer the latter part of this decade towards a future where UHC truly is a reality for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Max, so much for those comments and also for all the great work that Zenesis is doing. Um, and now with a community perspective, we're thrilled to have Maureen Moranga. She is a representative of affected communities. She's a former member of the Global Fund Board, and I'm very happy to say a member of the Friends of the Global Fight Board. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you everyone for the really uh, rich insights. Thank you, friends of the Global Fight, for the report, which is timely and what is really needed at this time. And I'm really happy to be um, part of these conversations and to see people talk about the results of what Global Fund has done that is contributing to universal health coverage. I, I was diagnosed um, with HIV um, in the early 2000s. And the history then is that our hospitals were unable to manage the numbers. So if you became sicker, or if you went into what they called stage four, your family or your friends would be called to take you home and, and take care of you at home. And because it was a stigmatized disease, families never came. So it is us who went for our peers, we learned how to provide palliative care 
and we watched them die, sometimes with dignity, sometimes not. Yeah, it was sometimes even difficult to get a painkiller. And so we watched people die in pain. And these are very dreading moments. Every time there's a global fund replenishment, we think that if it doesn't happen, then we may go back to those days because our countries are still um, fighting with the fiscal space of taking up uh, the three diseases. So um, through that process, uh, the groups that were providing or the peers or people living with HIV that were providing palliative care are the ones that were converted to community health workers. And the concept of community health workers came into very many countries. And this is what is currently being used for primary health care and what many countries are coming as universal health coverage. And, and we have seen Global Fund invest in that over the years, and they still continue investing in community health workers. In my country right now, um, uh, President Ruto is very focused on, on uh, com I mean, universal health coverage, UHC, but he's using the community health workers, he's now calling them community health promoters, but still Global Fund is significantly funding that aspect of, of the program. We have also seen investment in RSSH with stronger health systems. And you know, I, I just realized that when the health systems are stronger, the diseases are fewer. Our hospitals are not as jammed as they were during that time when uh, we used to be asked to take our people back home. So we have seen the health systems getting stronger. Community systems are also stronger at the community level, promoting prevention of diseases. Communities are more resilient, and that is because of the RSSH. It has a com component of community system strengthening. So communities are more resilient to prevention and to deliver health services at the community level, building on the uh, uh, on the pillar of universal health coverage. Um, so I can say that UHC is also about equity and addressing the drivers of the diseases. And we have seen how Global Fund has invested in um, human rights, gender equality, and, and this has ensured that everyone, regardless of their identity, are able to access services, regardless of their economic um, uh, prowess. Some people could not or still cannot afford the kind of treatment they need to keep them alive. They're still able to do that. And also that um, geographically, it doesn't matter where you come from, you get an opportunity uh, to access treatment and to live longer. So I think that um, just by creating that form of equity, uh, Global Fund is contributing significantly to having a universal health coverage that ensures no one is left behind. So I want to agree with everyone that what Global Fund does contributes to UHC. I don't think there's any healthier competition uh, compared to investing in health of them, I mean, investing in the most deadliest diseases of this world, because these diseases contribute significantly to the health and well being of any society. By eliminating HIV, TB, and malaria, you increasingly eliminate a whole chunk of sick. Uh, of, of hospital demands and health, because these diseases are in, interconnected with other human diseases. If I don't address HIV, I'll get TB. Uh, if I, and I'll get other diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea. So it, it is a, a, co a complex uh, kind of cycle of diseases that are encompassed with the three deadliest diseases or three deadliest epidemics that Global Fund is addressing. So as affected communities, we believe that Global Fund is taking a huge chunk uh, in ensuring that we have healthy societies, we have strong communities, and people, regardless of where they are, are able to access health services. And this is what we call UHC from our term. So that is Global Fund's share of uh, co uh, contribution to UHC. And I don't think the private sector should worry about investing more in that because it is a preventive kind of um, uh, investment as well. Uh, if most of us are not bedridden, then we are able to um, contribute to the society and to your company. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maureen, for that wonderful comment. And, you know, I just, I want to say too, you know, the Global Fund is a partnership. It's all about partnership. And everybody who's speaking on this webinar today is a critical part of that partnership and in making that dream happen. So I just want to thank all of you for all those comments. Um, now to close us out with some uh, 
concluding uh, thoughts is Rob Hecht, and he's president of Pharos Global Health Advisors. And I want to say also, Rob and Pharos helped uh, uh, a great deal with uh, our report, and I really appreciate his contributions and Shun's contributions as well to make the report possible. So thanks so much to both of you. Rob, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And it's uh, hard to follow all these brilliant and passionate uh, comments. Um, in full disclosure, I'm glad you mentioned, Chris, that we had provided some technical support to this uh, work, but it's not our report, it's yours. So we're, we're just happy to be uh, a contributor. Uh, let me say a word about why I think this report matters, Chris, for you and for everybody else on the line. Um, to me, uh, it's a sympathetic, um, but independent and data-driven look at the Global Fund uh, and how it is contributing to universal health coverage, mainly but not exclusively through this pathway of health system strengthening. And in that sense, I think it's quite unique uh, uh, in what it in what it covers and what it says. So I just want to highlight the significance of this work and put it in perspective. Um, in my remaining uh, four and a half minutes, I just want to touch Chris on five or six things that you might not have known about the Global Fund before you read this report, things that I think uh, shed new light on the Global Fund and its accomplishments and its capabilities. Um, the first one has to do with scale. Um, Sean and others mentioned one and a half billion dollars, perhaps two billion if you include the COVID-19 response mechanism funding. Uh, that portion of the overall Global Fund portfolio that is really dedicated to health system strengthening, that's about 5% of all international assistance for health. Um, and that makes the Global Fund uh, a very major contributor to health system strengthening and uh, to development assistance for health overall. And I'm not even counting the money that is classified as being more disease focused, which is even larger. So that's one thing you might not have known. Um, secondly, did you know that the Global Fund, in addition to working at the country level, really is helping to create these so-called global public goods or things that uh, benefit all of us uh, through its investments? You mentioned, Chris, I think the, um, the health management information systems, the fact that the DHIS2 is um, heavily, heavily supported by the Global Fund uh, and being implemented with Global Fund support in, in many countries across the world. Um, the same is true for the Global Fund's role in so-called market shaping or getting us uh, better, better, more reliable prices for things like malaria bed nets. That's because of the Global Fund. That doesn't just benefit Mozambique or Malawi or any individual country, but it benefits everyone. Um, a third thing you might not know is how important the Global Fund's contribution has become in human resources for for health. You have those 10 areas, but I'm just gonna pick out two or three very quickly. Um, the fact that the Global Fund was heavily responsible for the training of this very vast community health worker force in, uh, in the DR Congo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and that it basically has kept Zimbabwe's health system afloat for the last five, 10 years as Zimbabwe has gone through very tough uh, economic and fiscal times. This is again, the Global Fund that's come in, not as a long-term solution, but as a very critical stop gap, with, gap without which uh, all health services in uh, Zimbabwe would be seriously compromised. Um, did you know about the, the Global Fund's contribution, as I said, to the uh, health information systems? There's the example in the report of how working on uh, an integrated health information and surveillance system not only covers things like AIDS, TB, and malaria, but also childhood immunizations and also neglected tropical diseases like on onchocerciasis. So uh, this is, uh, again, a contribution of the Global Fund you might not realize uh, uh, at first glance. The expanded role of the Global Fund uh, in working with uh, oxygen therapy um, started under COVID, but uh, a huge investment, over $600 million so far and counting to help countries with respiratory uh, failures, not just from COVID, but from uh, uh, childhood pneumonias and obstetric crises and a whole series of needs in surgery where uh, oxygen is critical. This goes well beyond uh, AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, and uh, I think the report mentions the uh, a major contribution of uh, 
Global Fund to Oxygen in Kenya. Uh, and then finally, um, I heard Sarah Bolton mentioning sustainability and, and domestic financing. Um, the report brings out the fact that the Global Fund has been crowding in and encouraging more national spending uh, in health systems, not only for the three diseases, but also explicitly for health system strengthening that goes beyond the three diseases. That's measured by the Global Fund as part of its uh, contribution to financial strength and capacity building working toward UHC. So I just wanted to mention those, Chris, as things that people might not fully be aware of. And when you're talking to your friends about the Global Fund after this report is fully uh, circulated, you might wanna highlight that there's some things about the Global Fund uh, health systems in UHC that uh, most people don't know that need to be better understood. So uh, I'm gonna stop there. I think the Global Fund can always do better in these areas around health systems. Shun and his team are, and, and no one is more aware than they are of the, the ways in which the Global Fund wants to do more and do better. So there's still some distance to travel, but I do think the Global Fund needs to be recognized as a very uh, major player in health systems. Uh, and in this regard, it's contributing to uh, universal health coverage. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin. And again, thank you so much for your help with the report. We're ready to go into Q&A. Before we do that, I wanted to say I do hope everybody can access the report and share it. It's at theglobalfight.org on the web, uh, uh, the Friends website. Um, in addition, I want to acknowledge a couple people. Mike Isabel uh, worked very hard on this report and made a huge contribution to making it happen with the Friends team. So thanks, Mike. And Aria Vias of our uh, communications team has been essential in setting up today's webinar. Thank you, Aria. So let's go to questions that we've received. And the first one is from David Bryden. He says, it's exciting that Global Fund investments in health systems and PPR pandemic preparedness are increasing. How will the Global Fund government's model adapt to this shift? Will the Global Fund board and CCMs include independent experts in these areas or community representatives such as health workers, primary care advocates, or others with a broader role than for specific diseases? That sounds like something for Shun. Thank you. Happy. Sorry. Happy to take that question. You. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we hear you. You're good. Okay. Great. Yeah. Sorry. I'm. I'm with Rob. Uh, so we are now doing uh, some mic mic changes. So uh, this is exactly the topic that we have been discussing, and we ha just had a very uh, informative workshop with countries, uh, partners, and the uh, uh, our secretariat team. Uh, but maybe one thing to highlight. Shin, are you there? We, you're freezing. So Shun froze there for a minute. So why don't we come back on this question and go to the next one um, from, do we, let me see if Shun, oh, we'll, let's go on. Um, so uh, what do experts here think of the role of the human rights plays in achieving UHC and how big of a role does Global Fund play in that area? And can you speak to the human rights dimensions of UHC and, and how Global Fund is supporting uh, communities and countries in that? These questions come from Mandy and Gisa. Um, does anyone want to speak to those, those areas of the critical role of, of human rights in UHC? Rob, go ahead. A comment from our panelists on human rights and UHC. I would say, you know, this is one of those areas where the Global Fund, I really think, it has always placed a premium and in fact has dedicated programs to advance the human rights environment um, in countries. And uh, in addition, um, has really emphasized reaching the most vulnerable and having particular programs in place that can reach the most vulnerable and marginalized folks uh, in their societies. So uh, I think 
the human rights perspective is sort of part of the DNA of the Global Fund. And one of those areas, I would argue, needs to be part of the Global Fund, but also we need to take out more broadly as we build UHC and pandemic preparedness. They've got to be founded in human rights. And it's one of the things the Global Fund tries to get right. Shun, I see you're back with us. Uh, uh, you want to give another try on that? Yeah, my apologies. I don't know what happened, but internet problem. No uh, yeah, so what I was going to, to say was we really uh, intentionally engage with the health system entity to lead the implementation. And then uh, the in, in terms of CCM uh, conversation, we already have Ministry of Health uh, representative in most of the countries. But what's really critical is the voice and commitment from the senior management of the Ministry of Health to really engage in the health system work. That is something that we are working on, what we can do to further enhance it. So there has been some uh, good changes in uh, the implementation arrangement that we have been pushing, and COVID-19 resources uh, actually has been really helping on that. Thank you. Wonderful. Rob, go ahead. Rob, did you have a comment? Sorry, yes, I'm back, sorry. Uh, I, Chris, I just wanted to add to what you were saying on the human rights issue. Um, I thought your answer was spot on. I just wanted to add that two things. One is that uh, for those of us who work a lot on UHC and trying to put it into practice, um, in all countries, the commitment to UHC is really grounded in a human rights argument about the, the right to health for everybody. Uh, access, equity, and so on. And in, in my experience working with the human rights groups that the Global Fund supports, um, the, the call for that type of uh, broader equitable access to health services accompanies the, the human rights uh, arguments around key populations and other stigmatized groups and so on. Uh, so I see it really as part and parcel and a natural uh, area for Global Fund and for Global Fund human rights uh, analysts and advocates and, and, and other groups to support. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's, let's go to, um, uh, we have another question from Annette. Uh, what can we do to make sure community health workers are not only paid, but paid a living wage? Community health workers not only often come from impacted communities, they are irreplaceable, an irreplaceable entry point into health systems for many people. No wor health workers should be left behind. Any comment? Several of us have talked about the, the absolutely essential role of community health workers and increasing global fund support in that area. But um, Maureen, others, any more to say about community health workers' compensation and other issues? Uh, may I? Good, may I? Yes, oh, please. Dr. Afzal, please go ahead. Uh, uh, in Pakistan, the lady health worker were initially, when that program was created, was more uh, a stipend-based program. Uh, but after 2012, uh, we have regularized uh, all the lady health workers across the country, and we have around 100,000 lady health workers, and they cover around 60% of the rural Pakistan. And we are a very populous, we are a populous country, so there's a large number of population they cover. Um, after COVID and uh, uh, when we Pakistan developed the central package of health services, uh, we had a, we uh, have a fifth evaluation of our lady health workers, and we have uh, uh, there were many uh, key recommendations were there. Based on those re uh, key recommendations, we have revised uh, their curricula. Uh, uh, their manual and have included many things keeping the emergency, their role in emergency preparedness and prevention and engaging them in with more integrated approach uh, uh, to course of life. 
rather than uh, where initially they were more focused on RM and CH services, but now they are looking at more um, uh, integrated approach and there is a counseling card and everything. Um, it's mainly in Urdu, so even if somebody wants to reach it, they, it's available on our website in the Knowledge Hub. Uh, so, um, like payment um, in most countries, uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, other countries in Pakistan, all the lady health workers are regular uh, paid, uh, uh, let's say, employee of the health system. I'll stop there. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, Shun, did, did you have your hand up? Thank you. Yeah. So uh, just to, to add to Dr. Fafsa, who actually explain an excellent example of the community health workers. Uh, our approach, uh, what we are trying to help uh, countries uh, is really uh, on that point to make sure that community health workers are well supported. That means the contracted as a regular health workforce, paid on time uh, through the country system and uh, are equipped with the sufficient commodities and the drugs and tests, and then supported through the supervision Support and protected system. by uh, the immunization and IPC measures. So those are the key elements of the maturity of the community health worker system that we are aiming to support. So whenever we have uh, investment uh, in community health workers, which is huge now, about, probably about $900 million in the next three years or so, uh, we really look at the maturity of the system and support to advance that health worker system of the country and really led by the country community health unit and ministry of health thank you great thank you and and i see a comment written in by marine moranga um it, you know the that she says communities need to be more engaged in advocacy for domestic resource mobilization and country level negotiations different countries have different models of recognition of community health workers. And just to say, Maureen really has been a pioneer in terms of domestic resource mobilization in her own country. And, and we wanna thank her for that. We've got three minutes left. That's probably time for one more question. Um, so uh, another question from David, a crucial step in reaching UHC is providing universal access to health insurance as seen in Japan and other countries. How is the Global Fund contributing to the effort to establish comprehensible and affordable health insurance in LMICs, low and middle income countries? And I, I would note we have we will stop right at the hour, so we just have a few minutes. So on this question of health insurance, is there a comment? I'm happy to respond. Please. Yeah, so the Global Fund's main approach to health systems now uh, is really to support the key function of the health system uh, that contributes to HIV, TB, and malaria, and then the broader health outcomes. So we really take the approach of supporting key functions like laboratory system, surveillance system, oxygen and respiratory care system to build the, its maturity over time through the long-term investment. So we are less focused on the health insurance, although fully acknowledge uh, the importance of uh, supporting the health insurance system. Myself came from the, the World Bank that supports the those investments. So as we go forward, uh, we support together with the World Bank through blended finance on the more integrated package of care that also includes some health uh, insurance uh, package. So we may further uh, increase our kind of collaboration to leverage the strength that the World Bank has and then make sure that our support reaches the uh, key vulnerable population and HIV, TB, and malaria constituencies too. Wonderful. Thank you, Shun. We're at the top of the hour. I want to thank everybody who's been part of this. Uh, it's been a really wonderful discussion. Um, and just thank you for everything you're doing uh, to advance health equity for people around the world. Thanks to everyone who's joined. Please do access the report. We welcome your comments. Um, thank you so much and have a great day. Thank, thank you. you so much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.